Welcome to Checking In with Dr. B, a space designed for live conversations with those who have found and lived their joy. Checking in today is Leon Foster Thomas, internationally renowned jazz panist, researcher, educator, and more. Welcome, Leon. Pleasure to have me here. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so, Leon, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, Tell, tell me a little bit about your journey. You know, what has brought you to this point? And I know this point is a very exciting point. So t tell, tell me. Um, well, you know, grew up in Trinidad, San Fernando, and started playing African drums, grew up in the best village art form and everything like that. Funny enough, people don't really, wouldn't believe I never liked steel pan <laughs> as the instrument. So now it's, you know, it's, this instrument that I feel so, um, so much affinity for, and 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 drive to see, uh, to see it be be respected in a on a worldwide spectrum, and in many stages, um, you know, so from that, you know, um, just the various people that I got in contact with, from Ken Professor Phil Moore to Bugsy Sharp, Ray Holman, yourself, and and so on and you know so from trinidad to college to touring <laughs> um to places i didn't even expect to be like you know like you know russia and so on and and um to here now we're in england you know so we we get it and what's happening what are you doing in england now yeah so we're doing the phd can um pursuing a PhD in Caribbean jazz of the Ang Anglophone and Francophone Caribbean. What made, at, at what university, first of all? Oh yeah, yeah, we're at, um, I'm at the Royal Holloway University of London. Yeah. And what made you decide to focus in on Caribbean jazz? You know, really important, most importantly with that actually was the idea of when we were, you know, well, I keep saying we, but, in the career pushing a jazz, uh, playing jazz with steel pan or even our narrative of like Caribbean music. And you start, you kept getting like, oh, this music doesn't belong here, or this is, you know, this not, this is not a jazz instrument and so on. And I, I never believed that I, you know, once it's just music, it's music. And, um, Almost a year ago, actually, right before I, I applied for the university, we um actually a little bit more than a year now. I had got an agent. We was trying to work on you know preliminary stuff, and she was talking to someone in France, and they were like, "Oh, it doesn't have an audience for Pan, and it doesn't have this." And I'm like, you know, and I'm like, and I I asked her very um you know politely, of course, um, you know. Is he referring to either who's playing or what's playing it? Because I was just in France and there's a huge audience, you know. And uh, we kind of left it there, but it left me with a bit of like, okay, yeah, we really need to do this thing. We really need to do this thing. So after the masters, I started talking about Caribbean jazz, doing my masters at Florida International in 2012, and. Um, I kind of put it down because they asked me to do something on um, jazz history, but any subject that I wanted to, and I thought that was the right opportunity to talk about that. Um, looking at that paper, you could have seen so many things I was very naive about. However, the it was a starting point to where I am now to, to really start getting the conversation happening. You were, after um, Florida International, you were at University of Miami, for a little while, were you? What were yes. you doing there? Yeah, I was um, adjunct professor of the um, the studio jazz department, um, teaching um, oral skills, and also running the um, the Billy Strayhorn Ensemble. And um, I introduced the Melton Mustafa Ensemble. Not sure if they still have it, but yeah, I introduced the Melton Mustafa Ensemble. Uh -huh. And did you incorporate Pan with all of that? Um, no, actually, we didn't have any PAN students. The opportunities were limited for me as well. Um, I, I actually did one performance, and my students, the next day, were they could believe what they heard. They couldn't believe what they saw. And, um, 
but still the opportunities were far and few to to do anything or to be featured in some of the school concerts and so on um so i just thought i need to just do something else at some point you know and and what made you decide to look at at, at london at england for the mm. next step in the journey well one we wanted to um we've we've after living in miami for so long we, we we wanted something new we wanted something fresh um also with the political climate we were really just thinking well where would be a best place the best place for our children and so on um you know my wife and i she, we were we really like england actually we came here at one point and um, we were like yeah i could do this i could do this we all could we both can do it and over the years for me coming back and forth um working with like the steel orchestras mangrove and so on um I, I kept telling myself i would sit on the train and go to various places and okay i could figure this out I'm, i could do this i could do this but also what we started i, st I saw within the community um and also progress from one for myself but also for my children now because now you have to think about two other these two uh other humans that we have <laughs> and um you know and where they can grow up that are that in my to me they would you know more connected to the Caribbean um heritage in that sense but also the area was like a breeding ground for successful young people Mm -hmm. So many people that you would stand up next to and you you didn't believe that um, you would only see them on a screen in a movie or someone in a commercial or someone's writing for Vogue and someone's doing this. And I'm like, well, yeah, this would be the actual place that I think would help them out and really give them a start a community to really connect with. It sounds very vibrant. And how has how is in your in your doctoral work, how is the pan being received? Well, I'm not doing much playing. I think, you know, with within the the um at the university, the, the music department is not that big. Um, however, I think we, everybody think I'm the superstar when it's because they read my resume. <laughs> so you know, you would come in, and um, I actually did one um a master class actually of of the British jazz scene, which. I knew very little. I had to cram in a bunch of information, but also then we gave a demonstration of some of the music and also some of my music, which I recently released. And then the questions started popping up and everything. And uh, we even had faculty even ask about having a steel orchestra at the university and so on. So um, it's been well received. I mean, even me just being here in London has been really, really, really well received. That is that is excellent, but yeah. what what exactly is Caribbean jazz? That's a really good question. We're still trying to figure out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you know, funny enough, because we're and I'm I'm actually going to take a little bit from some of the interviews I've been having. Um, you know, we're we're, we're talking about I think uh, what's his name. Um, Ron Reed actually said really, really nicely. It's it's the sweetness, and I've never really liked to hold on to this thing about the sweetness of the music. It's the sweetness, it's this love voice, this way of life that we all cling to. Um, it's our rhythm and blues from and the Ron Caribbean. Reed, the, let me just jump in there. Ron Reed at Berkeley School of Music, wonderful yes. bassist. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, 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 you know. And, um, you know, so Caribbean jazz is is literally this. It's really just our jazz music um, passed down from our ancestors. You know, the African the 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 ancestors that came through the Black Atlantic and gave us this nice music and really parallel to to the American jazz as they would call it and and. Um, it's really our voice from the Caribbean and in a great way of saying that, you know. You spoke about Lavwe. What is Lavwe? Yeah. <laughs> Lavwe we would I would consider as our swing, as our way of swing compared to, and again, it's that again to what Ron Reed had said, that sweetness, you know, that it, it's it's very 
hard to explain, but I think when you say sweetness, you know, our way of speaking, our, our way of moving, our movement, our cultural, our, our social, uh, how we interact socially and everything like that, our way of life, and I see it from that perspective. Um, in Haiti, you would have almost something the same, but it's just called something different. Martinique is something different. Uh, we determined that in even American music in the swing. So that idea of what swing is, love way is pretty much that, you know, that really inexplainable sweetness within our movement, in our music, but also a description of our social life, I would believe, within our music. Hmm, the social life as, as related to the music. What about the rhythms? Do you find rhythms mm -hmm. are different from those of, say, American jazz? Slightly, slightly. And I, I, I only attribute those to where we are geographically. Crazy enough, where we are geographically, the, uh, how things are interpreted or just the environment. There's something with the environment that we're still doing a bit more digging, to be quite honest. Um, with regards to the research and um, having more interviews. I've had a, actually an interview with um, Haitian percussionist who was born in Denmark, actually, um, uh, Marcus Swartz. And he was talking about religion and, and how deep with regards to the voodoo and the rara and about how it connected to the people socially. So rhythmically, you're talking about the various uh, practices that came from the Af from Africa within the countries and very various islands and so on that really took shape within the countries individually. And um, it's it's something amazing in, in that sense to, to put it to make to put it slightly. Yeah. I'm going to go back to something you said earlier. You spoke mm. about being um, involved in Best Village. What exactly was mm. Best Village and how did that change or, or affect your yeah. journey? Um, Best Village was, uh, man, and I, I was talking about this recently about Best Village being that connection to your to our roots, our folk, that was our community center, uh, connected to the community center, just as maybe the Paniards had took over as the community centers. Um, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about what it means to be Trinidadian or what Trinidadians are, uh, a Trinidadian is at that point. And what our folk music is, our history, we were talking about. I didn't think it actually helped even when uh, with the lessons in school at that point in time when you had to read the Frank Porter reading books and stuff. <laughs> so it helped, you know, when you're talking about certain folk songs, John B and the Road, yeah, yeah, John B and the Road, yeah. And it's like, okay, all these things about folk, um, Trinidad folk, it gave me a greater connection to understand who I am and where I came from. That had helped me throughout my music, which I write now, and... Um, you know, playing drums, understanding um, just what it, the essence maybe of what, what it is to be a, a Trinidadian, born in Trinidad, someone from Trinidad. Yeah. Now, when, when you, um, you spoke about your composing, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that, your process there, because now you have, is it four albums that you have released? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. talk a little bit about, about that because you have a ton of original music that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that is wonderful. Speak a little bit about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, from the, and I would kind of try to go a little bit chronologically, a little bit, well, from the first album. The first album was really just trying to let people know what the instrument could do. Um. So I was still kind of really figuring out well what it is I wanted to do or how I was how I was shaping my ideas and so on. The second album was more personal because it was about my daughter being born, and I wanted to have this conversation to her of how I felt uh, my feeling at that time to know that I was going to be a father. So the titles of the songs took shape in terms of um one of the album name was Brand New Mischief. 
So it was really kind of playful and certain little things with the melody. And I was, you know, so, you know, because there's certain parts I was still kind of, do I really want to play straight ahead jazz? Or do I want to play funk? Do I want to do this? So it was really a, a mixture of everything that I that that I was involved in, but with a bit more focus with that part, you know. So I, you know, with regards to writing and um, the chord structure, saying something about the music, what the chord structure is doing in terms of bringing forth more feelings and so on. Um, fast forward to the third album, which we call Metamorphosis, and. Metamorphosis was about the turning point, a turning point. Uh, uh, you know that whole idea of your the butter the the caterpillar into, into the cocoon and then you, you you turn into this butterfly. Hope a beautiful one. <laughs> and um, it was really growth, mat mat maturation that I felt with the music. I felt I was writing. I. It was really personal as well, too. I, I, I wrote from Kai Fusion. I was very unapologetic with what I wanted to say musically. I didn't I didn't want to be bound down by the idea of being commercialized and creating a commercial record or you know, when you if you're writing for people in Trinidad, where's the calypso? And I just wanted to write music that I felt represented myself um so hence like kai fusion um and this was kind of like also the birth of this maybe continuation but more of a greater statement of caribbean jazz where the accents how we speak how we do things was coming out in the music and all these things where its phrasings were in a way that it represented me i in and so on so from tunes like Kai Fusion to really, really personal tune by Call In The Corner, which is really about the frustrations of being in the music scene and sitting in a corner. I was literally in the corner of the house, just writing. Um, so the environment really, really, really um, helped me to get to, to write. I'd look at everything. I would look at people. I would... Uh, you know, you know, it's just anything at that point where you just feel like something is, it just comes that way. Um, to now my current record, is, which is um, Carla Sanitas, which is a tribute to my mother. Carla Sanitas is her middle name. And uh, crazy enough, it was starting off as a suite. Really? So, <laughs> it was starting off as a suite where there's tunes that we did not record um big orchestra pieces that that i have not <laughs> done anything with it yet um and at one point i think i was um i was watching the news or something like that and i think uh, um they were talking about not i think they were talking about these people the, the folks coming from south america and they were you know the caravan and this and that it was so politicized and it I sat there on the couch, I would never forget. We sat there on the couch and I was just being, getting really angry. And like, um, I, you know, in my mind it's like, these people don't really understand what it means to leave your home to look for a better living. I, you know, and, and right there and then I sat there and I wrote, I didn't even touch an instrument. I just wrote the lyrics and I wrote everything for the tune right there and we went and did a gig that same afternoon and I presented I am an immigrant. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So you know so just so so for you know to 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 cap everything with regards to that the music for me it has to tell a story. I see I see things visually rather than I have this formula to write music. I just see this picture and I, and I could write it out and I would see pain. I could, you know, and because within, you know, in reference to I am an immigrant, there's a certain section where within the trumpet solo, um, the, the trumpet solo, I call it the scream. The scream. Yeah, those, yeah, so that's part of the music. We changed the key and then it went to da 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 da. It's like screaming because you're at this point 
you you've you've left your home, you've lost everything, you're you're trying, you you, you don't have any money, you don't have anywhere to go, frustration builds in, and you 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 needed a place to scream out. So really, I am an immigrant was that me now embodying myself or putting myself in these people's situation, but with my uh, my twang, my Trinidadian twang and slang. So um the music has that so it represents that walk and and it sort of repeats it and but then the the the, the melody la da da it's just that just processing and it keeps going like that and then la da da ka da da. So I really wanted to make sure that I was speaking to the, when you would hear what the melody that you would hear that my me speaking from my um, mother country voice, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, you know, in listening to your music and and knowing you over the years, you are an, an incredible musician, but I've always found that you've surrounded yourself with other incredible musicians. Sometimes as, as, as people in the arts, sometimes we are afraid to be shown up because, yeah. and, and so we, 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 you know, stay away from somebody that's, that's too good. Maybe not, yeah. maybe better than me, <laughs> but it seems to me that you have surrounded, you have embraced Talk yeah. about that. Ah uh, man, I, I I would use this term and forgive me for saying so. Um, well, um, but not not a term. But um, I always wanted people to kick my ass. Mm. I always said that I I I would go because that would send me to the practice room and would 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 encourage me to keep working and okay, I'm not there yet. And when I so I would you know with these guys, my first band in Miami. Uh, we started this group called Crossover, Crossover Jazz. And you had Andrew Atkinson from Jamaica, amazing drummer. You have Jean Cars from New York of Haitian heritage. Um, um, Dave Siegel and Leo Brooks. And these were guys that when I knew, that I know when I get into the band room, they are going to bring it all the time. So I, I, I you know, so it was a way of me trying to understand. It was very raw. I have some of those recordings actually. Where I can hear how raw I was, but also um, it was a way of me really trying to understand my sound, understand um, the language, understand what it, um, what I wanted to say, and also my measuring stick. So I knew when we would go to jam sessions in, oh God, Churchill's in Miami on a Monday night, I knew I would go home really pissed off because all right this didn't happen what i was practicing didn't work out um you know even though people would like oh you sounded really good tonight i knew i didn't sound good but it was and still is that thing whereas um i always want to surround myself with musicians that is going to kick my ass so to speak and um but just to send me back to do my homework do my homework i i you know and um and just come back out again and it seems like it's working. <laughs> seems so, seems so. So the other musicians helping each well, all of the men musicians helping each other to rise, you know, not like mm -hmm. crabs in a barrel. But yeah, in your journeys, you've found some crabs. How have you, oh, yeah. you <laughs> been able to to you know pull yourself yeah. away from the crabs that might oh, be you know, and that's a really good one. Um, it hasn't really been easy, you know, and to not take on what people say. And it's been a it's been a conditioning of the mind. Whereas, um, you know what you've done, and you you know you did it well. And, um, and you know, and say for instance, panorama arranging for panorama, and uh, which is something I love. I love that uh, a lot, um, but the 
maybe the favoritism in some of these things, whereas people just don't see it that way, or you're getting about up there a bit too further than I am, and that kind of thing. And you see that. Um, the art's so full of ego. And um, you have, I, you know, everybody's trying to make it. Everybody's trying to make it. However, the way in which we're going about trying to make it, um, it's literally that crab in a barrel kind of thing and still continues. But in a way for me now, I um, try to pull myself away from it and just try not to let it bother me at this point. Um, especially, you know, well, it has helped me also to really develop what it is I'm proud of. So I know that what I am doing it is extremely different or unique towards everybody else. So, okay, you could go ahead and do that, but I, I, I can now focus on where I'm going, what it is I'm doing, how it is I want to do. I have said no to many people. I've spoken up about a lot of things which a lot of people wouldn't do. <laughs> and you know, sometimes when you, you know, you spoke out when I would speak out about certain things, I was like, oh boy, I think I just made it bad for myself. <laughs> But um, it, I knew what it is I was doing, and I believe I. I so I gambled on myself in a in a way to then not be pigeonholed and and not be fighting within that barrel. I could maybe still look down within the barrel, but also try to help people to come up, try to help people to realize that you you can create your own lane, um, <clears throat> you know, and. And that's why I feel really a lot with, with a lot of things on uh, music, especially coming from Trinidad as a Trinidadian, uh, knowing the potential of the music that is from the and the Caribbean as a, as a whole, but understanding that this, there, what is being sold is is to be selling too many dreams, candidly speaking, and we're selling so many dreams to the point where as it's leaving a lot of musicians frustrated or they're making them think that we have to keep pulling people down every time somebody try to make it rather than we celebrate them and, and, and go on from there. Or everybody feels they're owed something uh, if they did something. Um, and I look at that, whereas, oh man, you could design your own lane and keep it going and keep it going. You believe in that lane, let's just do the right things or whatever. Um, you know, we, there's so many examples by so many other people that I come to the realization there's more than one way compared to where every, a lot of people, they're not um, being taught to view things from that standpoint. It's just one thing, one way. This one has to be the best. And in order for this one has to be the best, well, I have to pull this one down uh, to get up there and, and so on. Um, so it's a bit difficult when you look at it from that point. It's very hard to deal with because you're my nature of helping people. And it 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 could break your heart in many areas. It could it definitely can because you believe in people. You put so many things in people and um and you you, you could see like you know this this thing could grow into something amazing, but I just don't, you know, people just don't understand that you know maybe their way of thinking not maybe but the way they are thinking or taught to think it's you know yeah it's it's that kind of way yeah you you said something really interesting you said that we're selling too many dreams what yeah. do you well you know everybody believes one scenario let me look at it i could put put it from this one scenario we were taught, you know, come out with an album, you're going to get signed, and you're going to do well, which is not necessarily true. And maybe the best thing for anybody right now is to not get signed <laughs> to a record label, you know, because you can, you have more control. Uh, I literally just left the record label, the Rope Dope record label from the last one, analyzing what had happened with that record which was the metamorphosis record to the one previous to that and what the record label was giving and what they were taking mm. um excuse me i wasn't privy too much with digital sales and all that because that was kind of now coming out in the thing you know digital sales 
2016 we released that record mm -hmm. and um yeah I could divulge part of that that contract where it's like you're giving up 50 percent of your digital sales I wasn't thinking too much about that um but when COVID hit, and, I, and I'm fast forwarding actually, when COVID hit, everybody realized what's happening, even with the Spotify and all this stuff, that the digital sales are very important because people are not buying, uh, well, people weren't touring at that point. So you can't sell them much physical stuff, but also the age that we're at, everything is more computerized, download. I want to download. I want. So giving away you now 50% of your sales, and I can tell you based on, that time to now which the album is less than a year old we've made um recouped more than what we ever did within the four five six uh years with ropado label not taking anything away from them but it gave me an idea of okay being independent on that so the idea of selling dreams where folks believe that you have to uh, have a, a record deal and all that that puts you into a lot of difficulties a lot of difficulties and it took me what <laughs> three albums to figure that out um i i would hope somebody doesn't have to do that you know or um, another scenario would be um oh we have to play pe music that people know hmm. you know to to get out there so um it's not necessarily a dig on anybody but what well, we have a bunch of really good pan players going online and they can do this stuff and but you're not getting any creativity. You're not. We, I think we're stifling our creativity to the, to a great extent because we believe that we have to do something what people like, and so we're more being what's the word? Um, <laughs> uh, more chameleons, uh, you know, in, in gimmicks, and so, rather than a. a, a rather than a place where people that is filled with a lot of creative musicians which we are mm -hmm. um so i was creativity is being stifled so this whole idea of this these dreams selling and you know you're going to sell a bunch of records and you're going to sell a bunch of this and you're going to meet this artist and you're going to meet that artist sometimes it's never really that simple could be luck but <laughs> part of it but you need a bit <laughs> you know and um I mean, maybe lastly on that point, because um, I've sat in rooms with record execs and um, uh, artists, big time artists, and I'm sitting down here with my pan and I'm like, okay, uh, what's going to happen? And you're just there, they're just flinging you here all around and nothing ain't happening. Mm. So after all this work, you then come down to realize, what am I doing this for? Um, and it, it, it could be very detrimental to the young musician if they're not strong mentally if they don't have a good background because a lot of us we don't have much money we don't have any money right and you know for people to understand how this thing really works how much it costs to put a record out what you need to do but also apart from putting the record on what you have to do with regards to publishing and marketing the record that's a whole nother scenario so rather than being truthful as to look it costs this amount it costs that amount, not to deter anybody, but to help us to prepare a little bit, be a bit more realistic. Mm. So I said all of that to really just to say be a bit more realistic with what's yeah. happening. As a musician, you know, as an artist, as a as an educator, as a researcher, there must be times, and you've you've referred to it, where things become difficult. What has sustained you? What sustains you through those times, mm -hmm. giving you the, the energy to move on to the next level? You know what? <laughs> For my wife, I have to give her a lot of credit. I have to give her a lot of credit, whereas, you know, you could do this. No, it's, it's only a little bit of time, even though sometimes I think she don't really understand. <laughs> Um, but you know, I mean, sometimes you just need that person in your corner to say, you know, you know, we can get them a next time or we'll try it a different angle or what have you. Um, my initial goal would leave in Trinidad to help our family. That's also the next thing. I you can't give up because it just seems like I'm the only one to do it. 
Um, but and then there's also I, I you know because there's many times I'm like yeah I'm good <laughs> I'm done <laughs> and um, something happens and then you get an idea and then these group of songs come in your head and oh, no nah, I need to record this I need to record this or I need to write this um, and all of a sudden you get sucked back in so I, I I think maybe it's something I'm supposed to be doing because every time I try to not do it. It keeps, um, uh, you know, there's it. Something just keeps coming up to show that I could do it, and but also the quality of what it is, um, I I would do that, you know, would really be encouraging, you know. And this album, Carlos Sinitas, is one of those. It's that definitely one. Um, the Metamorphosis as well in the corner was literally just that, whereas. I've had it. I, you know, that literally was me. Um, and that came about, sorry to, that came about when I was working on looking at Bobby McFarren, Ave Maria, and he's do 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 do. And I'm like, trying, you know, working it out. And, and then something in my head was just like, no, what are you doing this for? So it's really like a conversation I'm arguing with myself. In the corner of the room in the in, in the house in Miami, and like, why? It's not going to go anywhere. It's just so you're getting these voices by yourself, and just like that, I actually just down the sticks. I was like, mm -mm. you know, this is not making any sense. And all of a sudden, I just started hearing the melody, and I just wanted to speak, mm. and musically the so so compared to most of the other music from that record the melody was very sparse is i because i wanted air i wanted people to um when you're listening to really hear my frustration um and how tired i was you know of just the dreams and the, you know these dreams being sold or these I've done everything so you know and they said do this I did that they, I did this I did that and and it just seemed like it just a dead end mm -hmm. and so so most of that so that's how that that really came about um so my music really and a, a lot of times it expresses myself and it's very personal that I was very personal um there's another song in this in the Carlos Sinitos album called um, Silent Maze. Mm. And it's this maze in my head, whereas it's almost as if the music industry is, and like I said, do this, do that, and it's turn here, turn here, turn here, and it's a dead end. It, it literally felt like a maze. It feels like a maze at times. Um, or somebody, there's a dollar attached to a string, and every time you reach for it, it, it keeps moving. And that as well was that. And funny enough, when we recorded that song, I didn't really say much. <laughs> I didn't say much. Um, the saxophonist Troy Roberts had a lot to say. Uh. And <laughs> so he was done. We were done recording. Just a quick thing on that. We were done recording. And he said, um, you're not going to solo on this. I was like, I think you said everything that needed to be said. And so it's it's a matter of, you know, putting all these music, it's really just a matter of maybe just giving the music what it wants at that time. That's and peace. I think with it's yeah. Yeah. Of course to me sometimes the space says more than an abundance of, of notes. You know? Sometimes exactly. You know, you can live yeah. in that space. Yeah, yeah. You know, Miles Davis said it. Um Clyde Bradley said it. You know, and you know, um, and it, it rings true because I think the music, you, you know, the music says more. The music, the music says more. I think if you create ambience, uh, well, if the music is saying something, and the musicians are really connected, um, and we had a moment like that recently. I'm sorry to be um, going on. We had a moment like that recently where we did. Um, we played at Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club and 
uh, I presented this song together, which is on the album as well. And it's just really, you know, it's about my mother. I used to get in fights with my bigger brother and she's like, you know, you all need to live together and all that. Uh, so we were really in that moment. And again, we're, we're utilizing space musically, whereas the ambience is there and there isn't really much happening, but the melody is really touching on something and leaving you to reflect. <clears throat> and it got to a point where like, I think I really like went on a whole nother level. And next thing you know, I end up I end up bawling out boohoo on the people's stage. <laughs> yeah, so it was a serious moment, you know, whereas okay, okay, I think we we're 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 connecting somewhere, we're connecting with somewhere. And I but and in my head I could keep I could hear my mother keep saying, together, live together, live together, you know. Um, so yeah, you know. Wow. So so you actually you actually brought her presence to life in yeah, that yeah. moment. That that, yeah. is, that is what music can do for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When you travel and you've traveled extensively, what is the response to to the music? You spoke a little about that, but say when you're in Russia or, or wherever you where where there's a language barrier, uh, what is mm -hmm. the response? Crazy. I mean, it's amazing. It is amazing. Um, I, um, you know, from Germany to France, but I've gone through, I've, I've, I've traveled to Russia a bit extensively or spent a lot of time there over five, six years or so, been there five, six, seven times or so. And the or the the um the auditoriums are sold out, and it's like to hear you play, you know what I mean. And um, this never, you know, the first time it's like this never happened before. This television and what have you. The and it's so well received. It's so well received. Um, our the last time I went there, we I played with um Randy Brecker, John Beasley, and so on. And these guys are like extreme heavyweights. <laughs> But they had to put people on either side of the stage to block people from coming to see the pan number one. So from the time we left the pan there, every show, and maybe I could send it to you to see this picture where every show I'm showing, lifting the pan, showing the audience what it is. Um, you know, people bring flowers um, for after the show. And, you know, it, it, it's it's something else. It's wow. it's something that you, yeah, you dream about, you know, dream about that. and you know the, the language barrier yes but music it's you, you're connected in, in in a great 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 way um uh, so many experiences i went to belarus actually one point in one of the trips and what touched me a, a lot was people didn't have much money to come to the concerts or to buy a cd you're talking about three thousand rubles to 10 us dollars you know um and this guy brought a, a, a hat to trade. Um, I still have the hat today. He brought the hat to trade and he uh this the guy was translating and he was saying that he was in the hospital bed and the president of Belarus came by and gave him this hat. So he's trading the hat for um a CD. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. so it's yeah. So, so so many things where you go back and, and you you sit in the train or the bus or and it's like, you know, did this really happen? Yeah. Yeah, you, you sit there like oh, bring that connection through music, man. Uh, mm -hmm. say in 10, 10 years, you know, you finished your 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 doctoral work and so on. What would you like to see? Where would you like to be? You know what? Um, just to watch my girls do their thing, to be honest, <laughs> it sounds crazy. I mean, I'm, I think I got to a point where I'm I'm very satisfied with that. Watching them do their thing, and I I, I always said if my daughters want to play pan, I would drop them and sit down in the car. Nobody should know <laughs> fathers. <laughs> you know, and you know, um, because you know we go to everything that you know my Annecy does she's into um Annecy my big daughter sorry 
and, and she she's doing rounders she's doing um track she's she's been outside more than she's ever been in miami okay. <laughs> so, and, you know so it's done a whole lot more for her um academically she's been doing amazing so it really for me it's um yeah 10 years down the line i mean maybe just watching them do their thing um i legacy doesn't bother me that much in that sense i'm not chasing a legacy um really anymore it it just feels that i think if we've done something good i think if somebody picks up on it and we help somebody or we've done what we could i think that would be all right i'm i'm satisfied with that you know and um if we can really help somebody coming up or understand themselves as uh, a musician or what have you, I think that would be really good. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, maybe within the last few years, a lot of things, a lot of things with regards to my perspective has changed. Um, maturity, maybe, or I don't know. Sometimes people start calling me the black, um, the black, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Black Yoda <laughs> from <laughs> Star Wars. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't really started with a bunch of yoga or anything like that. But I, I, you know, I think the idea now to help people realize their dream or their part, or maybe not really realize, but understand the the part, then to know, okay, you could go and do this, and to know you could go and do that. Um, I think that is really, really gratifying rather than somebody saying, you know, thanks, you did this for me or or me. Oh, I help him get there or whatever the case is. Um, um, you know, those that's a huge lesson for me. And I would be a biggest cheerleader once I see you doing something, you know, when we see somebody doing something, I'm a huge cheerleader for that. So five, 10 years, we just hope we're in a great place and good music is happening. I think it'll be all right. <laughs> What would you like to see happening with the steel band, with the pan, nationally mm. and internationally? And... Oh, God, I, we might need a whole other segment for this. But... <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, passionately, I really, um, I wish we could really understand the business of music and not really look at pan as just the, the pan, the instrument, the object. Um, it's a movement. It's a, it's a movement. It's a business. It's 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 a a, a genre of music, if so, so to speak. Um, and what we have to offer, it's 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 bigger than what we think it is. But I don't think we really understand that um, because I think people. Are, it's like you put you you put in the cart the, the the cart before the horse. Where we're so concerned about the money mm -hmm. um we're so concerned about the money and making the money that we do whatever we need to do to get by and i hear so many of the excuses as to well this is the best we can do this is this is well it's pan well no it's more than that it's more than that it's there's so many people making a living there's so many people are interested in it there's so much when we really take people and spend time with 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 the instruments and the programs and so on and really help you know you know really see not you know look at it from really a perspective of even a piano or anything else we we we're, we're there and to really perfect the sound that's a whole other thing perfecting the sound um too many people are beating the pan you know to to that point where you don't really understand the sweetness of the music the to come out. Yes. yeah you know and and i had a student recently i was doing a one-on-one -on -one with one of the students at Guildhall university here and the first thing he, he started playing i said just play what you you know play a little something and his initial um stroke of the instrument i was like no no you know and you know, and I and I asked him. I said, um, I said, uh, "Do you have a girlfriend? Do you talk to her that way?" 
Mm. You know, I mean, you know, if you're in love with somebody, how do you talk to them? You know, and what kind of response you want to get from somebody if you approach it that way? So it's really to get us to really understand how to approach the instrument and really how sweetly it can really work. And structurally, then we could, we, you know, we can look at building things. I mean, I think we're just doing too many things to show people that we're doing something rather than and it means nothing. It means nothing. I, I, and so candidly, I think we're wasting a lot of time. I think we're stagnant. Mm. Um, I think steel pan is stagnant, and we're still waiting for the nineties to come back. Uh, yeah, we're still waiting on the nineties to come back. We're waiting for Bradley and Bugsy and it to well, Bradley to come back alive and yeah. Bugsy to do something more really amazing. And the young musicians and the young arrangers are not being encouraged. Uh, or the people who are there now, they're not being encouraged to be creative, being encouraged to let their voice be their own voice. Um, we could we could blame so much on the judges, but there's it's a societal thing. Whereas guys, you can hear when they talk like, "I really want to do this," but the crowd wants to hear this, mm. you know. And so I mean... maybe, yeah, you know, so maybe then we need another forum as well too because funny enough this is going to come back i think in my mind how i'm bringing this back best village you need community you need another stage we i see the lack of plays and we have so many good auditoriums but they're not being used well um showcases in terms of someone writing a, a suite of music or what have you and showcasing it for people to this is my music um rather than waiting for a competition to do so. And I, I think doing that, that is going to help our, our thing grow. It's going to help us understand what we have and who we who we really are as a people, you know, and and, and the possibilities of the power, the power of it, excuse me, um, to hear even the full orchestra, because uh, I have a piece actually with that I wrote with, it just involves a string orchestra and a jazz orchestra and a steel orchestra. Um, we it's been sitting there for some time now. Um, you know, and yeah, it's been sitting there for some time. But you know, it's but it's just a, for us to if we can really come together and do it. And I, I wish I could do it in Trinidad. I really wish and to do it, whereas no people can really see once we get the product done, get it mic'd properly. That's a whole nother thing where people you know, learn to understand miking the instrument, um, what types of mic we're looking at, um, you know, how to play on the microphone amplification, what are we looking for in our ears or in our, our monitors and, and so on. So I think really people understanding that the possibilities, all these nooks, these, these things in the nook and crannies of the, of the instrument and the art form you can you can really have something proper that we can really uh, market and people can actually make a living yes people can actually make a living because we have too many musicians and i i, I would say musicians because i don't like to refer to you know pan man and whatever like i think it's i think it's really you know we've moved up from that because they're you know they're playing an instrument and they're playing it pretty well but you have too many of them that we're not creating jobs for after Panorama, you have so many people that um, they're asking for a handout or they you don't, you don't know how to me. And we're not really investing in the in the art form. And you know, and I've said something actually even like a while ago in my Facebook post of having people publishing, having bands on their own publishing. That's it, yes. And you know, and that now encourages people to write more, that encourages people to build their library, create your own musical library, and all these tunes that you've invested over the years that your band has, because people are researching them, can come to your band, maybe pay a small fee or whatever the fee is, it's bringing in people to that band in particular. So no band really is supposed to be dead in Trinidad and Tobago right. because you've invested in all these, these, these things. 
that creates now a job for the possible future librarian because now because of your music library, somebody has to learn how to be a librarian. It opens a job for publicists. It opens a job for copyright. It opens a job for all these other things. Um, someone to write, and, and it keeps your band functioning. So really understanding this, you really what we have. I mean, there's so much I could go on from. Um, but if we can get that, because I I would love to see it grow. I you know, and, um, I've heard the cries a professor for many years and he points this he points this tattoo on his arm and this is all I've done for my life and whatever the case is. Um but also his plight to really see Pan in, in a greater place. In a greater place um on to watch somebody for some years I played with seven, eight years, but we've been really close for all that time that eat, sleep, and breathe the whole thing and get upset when it's not being featured in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, Len Bugsy Sharp maybe is more quiet to the being of it, but I, you could see the same passion for it, you know, and Robert Greenwich and so on. Um, Jit Samaru, just what he did for um, the young players and, you know, him being chastised of even playing in Pan at that time, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. you, you know, so, so it's just, I think... We need, you know, if we would really step into the now and have forums where we, but fruitful forums, not just talk and we just leave it there, but fruitful forums where we can show people a path. And I think the University of the West Indies and um, uh, UTT has a lot, could play a great part in that, um, where we could be proud of our music proud of ourselves, proud of our creativity. And that's a statement that I try to make, not try to make, I'm making with the music that I write. I have no apologies for where I come from or, you know, <laughs> this is me. <laughs> right. So, yes, yeah. and is a cottage industry, lifting all mm. boats. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but Leon has been wonderful speaking with you. Is there anything Thank we have you. touched on that you'd like to say as we? Ooh, man. I mean... <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm saying so much. <laughs> um, you know, um, I think like just really people just learn the business of it. Learn, pay attention to the business, but I think we have a product, uh, and really understanding the business. Um, understanding the copyright of music and um, what could be, you know, I mean, it's kind of connected to maybe what I've talked about before, but what could be very beneficial and and and, and good for us? Um, because so many people are taking, they're taking, and they've been taking, and we, we you know, we're just there like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Um, there are times I feel like we have a, this serious colonial mindset. Not at times. I believe that we have this colonial mindset that, you know, we can't do anything and everybody else can do what they want with it. Um, sometimes when you, you speak out or they're afraid to speak out, you know, it's because I'm afraid what people are going to say. <laughs> but I think unitedly, if we can, this is on music, the entire art um, music scene in Trinidad and even in the rest of the Caribbean. If we could start being together because everybody talk, everyone talks about, I want to win a Grammy, I want to do this, I want to do that. Well, you know, nobody's going to invest in people who don't invest in themselves. And, 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 and just showing interest in what it is we're doing, showing, um, you know, and listening to, you know, the ideas or people just listening. And, yeah, that That's, I think societal, uh, uh, that was going to help us, our society in a great way, not just steel pan and what have you, but, you know, but for these nice group of people who wants to sit, you know, behind a pan and you put in all this time or, you know, <laughs> behind your piano or whatever, to believe in, in what it is you can do. You might be way better than I am, you know, and get further off than I am. I think it's a great thing if we could see more of that, you know, so... Yeah, that's my extra. <laughs> that's wonderful. Uh, 
Thank you, Leon. It's been, as I said, you, it's been such a pleasure. And I'm, I keep you. watching you as you rise and looking at the young ladies as they too rise in the future. Yeah. Doing what they're doing now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Dr. Batson. Oh, yeah. thank you for being here. Yes. Welcome to Checking In with Dr. B. In addition to our video podcast, we invite you to join our Jumpstart Network at keepyourjoyandrise.com. There you'll have access to questions and answers with our guests, virtual meetups, and opportunities to suggest and participate in workshops and spur-of-the-moment talk and jam sessions. We are creating a community of positive thinkers and doers. Come join!